Section 15 of Canada, The Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, The Empire of the North by Agnes C. Locke From 1672 to 1688, Part 3 The river gathered volume as it rolled southward, carving the clay cliffs of its banks in a thousand fantastic forms. Where the bank was broken, the prairies were seen in heaving seas of grass billowing to the wind like water, herds of countless buffalo pasturing knee-deep. To Marquette and Joliet, burning with enthusiasm, it seemed as if they were finding a new world for France, half as large as all Europe. For two weeks, not a sail, not a canoe, not a soul did they see. Then the river carried them into the country of the Illinois, past Illinois Indians who wore French clothing and pictured rocks where the Indians had painted their sign language. There was no doubt now in the explorers' minds. The Mississippi did not lead to China, but emptied in the Gulf of Mexico, a furious torrent of boiling, muddy water pouring in on the right forewarned the Missouri, and in a few more days they passed on the left the clear current of a beautiful river, the Ohio. It was now midsummer. The heat was heavy and humid. Marquette's health began to suffer, and the two explorers spread an awning of sailcloth above the canoe as they glided with the current. Towards the Arkansas, Indians appeared on the banks, brandishing weapons of Spanish make, though Juliet, with a peace pipe from the Illinois Indians, succeeded in reassuring the hostiles. It was unsafe to go farther south. They established the fact the Mississippi emptied into the Gulf of Mexico, and on July 17th turned back. It was harder going against the stream, which did not mend Marquette's health. So when the Illinois Indians offered to show them a shorter way to Lake Michigan, they followed up Illinois River and crossed the Chicago portage to Lake Michigan. Joliet went on down to Quebec with his report. Marquette remained half ill to establish missions in Michigan. Here, traveling with his Indians in 1675, the priest died of the malady contracted in the Mississippi heat, and he was buried in a lonely grave of the wildwood wilderness where he had wandered. Louis Jolette married and settled down on his seigneury of Anticosti Island. Though he had as yet little to show for La Chien estate, which he had sacrificed, La Salle had not been idle, but he was busy pushing French dominion by another route to the Mississippi. Count Frontenac had come to New France as all the viceroys came, penniless to mend his fortunes, and as the salary of the governor did not exceed three thousand dollars a year, the only way to wealth was by the fur trade. But which way to look for fur trade? Hudson Bay, thanks to Radisson, was in the hands of England. Tadoussac was farmed out to the king. The merchants of Quebec and Three Rivers and Montreal absorbed all the furs of the tribes from Ottawa, and New England drained the Iroquois land. There remained but one avenue of new trade, and that was west of the lakes where Joliet had been. Taking only La Salle into his confidence, Frontenac issued a royal mandate commanding all the officers and people of New France to contribute a quota of men for the establishment of a fort on Lake Ontario. By June 28, 1673, the same year that Joliet had been dispatched for the Mississippi, there had gathered at La Chine, La Salle's old signatory near Montreal, 400 armed men and 120 canoes, which Frontenac ordered painted gaudily in red and blue. With these, the governor moved in stately array up the St. Lawrence, setting the leafy avenues of the 
thousand islands ringing with trumpet and bugle and sweeping across lake ontario in martial lines to the measured stroke of a hundred paddles long since la salle scouts had scurried from canton to canton rallying the iroquois to the council of great on ontio at break of day july thirteenth while the sunrise was just bursting up over the lake frontenac with soldiers drawn up under arms himself in a velvet cloak laced with gold braid met the chiefs of the iroquois confederacy at the place to be known for years as fort frontenac now known as kingston a quiet little city at the entrance of lake ontario on the north shore ostensibly the powwow was to maintain peace in reality it was to attract the iroquois and all the tribes with whom they traded away from the english down to frontenac's new fort with their furs it is a question if all the military pomp deceived a living soul before the governor had set his sappers to work on the foundation of a fort the merchants of montreal les bars and les moyes and le chesnays and les forests were furious with jealousy undoubtedly fort frontenac would be the most valuable fur post in america determined to have the support of the court where his wife was in high favor count frontenac dispatched la salle to france in sixteen seventy four with letters of strongest recommendation which no doubt jean talon the former intendant endorsed on the spot la salle's case was a strong one he was to offer to found a line of forts establishing french dominion from lake ontario to the valley of the mississippi which juliet had just explored in return he asked for patent of nobility and the grant of seigneury at fort frontenac in other words the monopoly of the furs there which would easily clear him twenty thousand dollars a year it has never been proved but one may suspect that his profits were to be divided with count frontenac both requests at once were granted and la salle came back to a hornet's nest of enmity in canada space forbids to tell the means taken to defeat him for by promising to support recollect friars at his fort instead of jesuits la salle had added to the enemy of the merchants the hatred of the jesuits poison was put in his food iroquois were stirred up to hostility against him meanwhile no amenity checks his ardor he has replaced the wooden walls of fort frontenac with stone mounted ten cannon manned the fort with twenty soldiers maintained more than forty workmen cleared one hundred acres for crops and in sixteen seventy seven is off again for france to ask permission to build another fort above niagara this time when la salle comes out he is accompanied by a man famous in american annals a soldier of fortune from italy cousin of duluth the bush rover one henry taunty a man with a copper hand his arm having been shattered in war who presently comes to have repute among the indians as a great medicine man because blows struck by that metal hand have a way of being effective by sixteen seventy eight the fort is built above niagara by sixteen seventy nine a vessel of forty five tons and ten cannon is launched on lake erie the griffin the first vessel to plow the waters of the great lakes as she slides off her skids august seventeenth to go up to michilmackinac for a cargo of furs te deum is chanted from the new fort and louis hennepin the dutch friar standing on deck in full vestments asks heaven's blessing on the ship's venture scant is the courtesy of the michilmackinac traders as the griffin's guns roar salute to the fort cold is the welcome of the jesuits as la salle enters their chapel dressed in scarlet mantle trimmed with gold and to be frank though la salle was backed by the king he had no right to trade at michilmackinac 
for his monopoly explicitly states he shall not interfere with the trade of the north but barter only with the tribes towards the illinois never mind he loads his ships to the water line with furs to pay his increasing debts and sends the ship on down to niagara with the cargo while he and tonty with different parties proceed to the south end of lake michigan to cross the chicago portage leading to the mississippi did the jealous traders bribe the pilot to sink the ship to bottom who knows certain it is when tonty and la salle went down the illinois early in the new year of sixteen eighty news of disasters came thick and fast the griffin had sunk with all her cargo the ship from france with the year's supplies for la salle at fort frontenac had been wrecked at the mouth of the st lawrence and worse than these losses which meant financial ruin here among the illinois indians were mascoutin indian spies bribed to stir up trouble for la salle small wonder that he named the fort built here fort creve cure fort broken heart if la salle had been fur trader only and his enemies averred not patriot one wonders why he did not sit still in his fort at frontenac and draw his profits of twenty thousand dollars a year instead of risking loss and poison and ruin and calamity and death by chasing the phantom of his great desire to found a new france on the mississippi never pausing to repine he orders hennepin the friar to take two voyageurs and descend illinois river as far as the mississippi taunty he leaves in charge of the illinois fort he himself proceeds overland the width of half a continent to fort frontenac and montreal friar hennepin's adventures have been told in his own book of marvels half truth half lies joliet it will be remembered had explored the great river south of the wisconsin hennepin struck up from the mouth of the illinois to explore north and he found enough adventure to satisfy his marvel loving soul the sioux captured him somewhere near the wisconsin in the wanderings of his captivity he went as far north as the falls of st anthony the site of minnesota's twin cities and he finally fell in with a band of Duluth bush rovers from Kaminiskwia, modern Fort William, Lake Superior. The rest of the story of La Salle on the Mississippi is more history of the United States than of Canada, and must be given in a few words. When La Salle returned from interviewing his creditors on the St. Lawrence, he found the Illinois Indians dispersed by hostile Iroquois, whom his enemies had hounded on fort crevecoeur had been destroyed and plundered by mutineers among his own men only tonty and two or three others had remained faithful and they had fled for their lives to lake michigan not knowing where tonty had taken refuge la salle pushed on down the illinois river and for the first time behind the mississippi the goal of all his dreams but anxiety for his lost man robbed the event of all jubilation. Once more united with Tonty at Michimikinac, La Salle returned dauntlessly to the Illinois. Late in the fall of 1681, he set out with 18 Indians and 20 Frenchmen from Lake Michigan for the Illinois. February 1682 saw the canoes floating down the winter swollen current of the illinois river for mississippi which was reached on the sixth a week later the river had cleared of ice and the voyageurs were camped amid the dense forests at the mouth of the missouri the weather became warmer trees were donning their bridal attire of spring and the air was heavy with the odor of blossoms instead of high cliffs carved fantastic by the waters came low-lying swamps full of reeds through which the canoes glided and lost themselves camp after camp of strange indian tribes they visited 
till finally they came to villages where the Indians were worshippers of the sun and wore clothing of Spanish make. By these signs La Salle guessed he was nearing the Gulf of Mexico. Fog lay longer on the river of mornings now. Ground was lower. They were nearing the sea. April 6 the river seemed to split into three channels. Different canoes followed each channel. The muddy river water became salty. Then the blue sky line opened up to the fore through the leafy vista of the forest-grown banks. Another paddle stroke, and the canoe shot out on the Gulf of Mexico, La Salle erect and silent and stern as was his wont. April ninth, sixteen eighty two, a cross is planted with claim to this domain for France. To fire of musketry and chant of Te Deum, a new empire is created for King Louis of France. Louisiana is its name. Take a map of North America. Look at it. What had the pathfinders of New France accomplished? Draw a line from Cape Breton to James Bay, from James Bay down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Gulf of Mexico across to Cape Breton. Inside the triangle lies the French Empire of the New World, in area the size of half Europe. That had the pathfinders accomplished for France. La Salle was too ill to proceed at once from the Mississippi to Quebec. As long as Frontenac remained governor, La Salle could rely on his hungry creditors and vicious enemies, now eager as wolves, to confiscate his furs and seize his seigneury at Fort Frontenac. Being restrained by the strong hand of the viceroy, but while La Salle lay ill at the Illinois fort, Frontenac was succeeded by Le Bar as viceroy, and the new governor was a weak, avaricious old man, ready to believe any evil tale carried to his ears. He at once sided with La Salle's enemies, and wrote the French king that the explorer's head was turned, that La Salle accomplished nothing but spent his life leading bandits through the forest, pillaging Indians, that all the story of discovering the Mississippi was a fabrication. When La Salle came from the wilderness, he found himself a ruined man. Fort Frontenac had been seized by his enemies. Supplies for the Mississippi had been stopped, and officers were on their way to seize the forts there. Leaving Tonti in charge of his interests, La Salle sailed for France, where he had a strong friend at court in Frontenac. As it happened, Spain and France were playing at the game of checkmating each other, and it pleased the French king to restore La Salle's forts and to give the Canadian explorer four ships to colonize the Mississippi by way of the Gulf of Mexico. This was to oust Spain from her ancient claim on the Gulf, but Bijou, the naval commander of the expedition, was not in sympathy with La Salle. Bijou was a noble by birth, La Salle only a noble of the merchant classes. The two bickered and quarreled from the first. By some blunder, when the ships reached the Gulf of Mexico, laden with colonists, in December of 1684, they missed the mouth of the Mississippi and anchored off Texas. The main ship sailed back to France. Two others were wrecked, and La Salle, in desperation, after several trips seeking the Mississippi, resolved to go overland by way of the Mississippi Valley and the Illinois to obtain aid in Canada for his colonists. All the world knows what happened. Near Trinity River in Texas, some of his men mutinied. Early in the morning of the 19th of March, 1687, La Salle left camp with a friar and Indian to ascertain what was delaying the plotters, who had not returned from the hunt. Suddenly La Salle seemed overwhelmed by a great sadness. He spoke of death. A moment later, catching sight of one of the delinquents, he had called out. A shot rang from the underbush. Another shot, and La Salle reeled forward, dead, with a bullet wound gaping in his forehead. 
The body of the man who had won a new empire for France was stripped and left naked, a prey to the foxes and caron birds. So perished Robert Cavalier de La Salle, aged 44. Nor need the fate of the mutineers be told here. The fate of mutineers is the same the world over. Having slain their commander, they fell on one another and perished, either at one other's hands or among the Indians. As for the colonists of men, women, and girls left in Texas, the few who were not massacred by the Indians fell into the hands of the Spaniards. La Salle's debts at the time of his death were what would now be half a million dollars. His life had ended in what the world calls ruin, but France entered into his heritage. With the passing of Robert de La Salle passes the heroic age of Canada, its age of youth's dream. Now was to come its manhood, its struggles, its wars, its nation-building, working out a greater destiny than any dream of youth. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 16 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Laund. From 1679 to 1713. Part one. Before leaving for France, Jean Talon, the intendant, had set another exploration in motion. English trade was now in full sway on Hudson Bay. In possession of the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Illinois, the Great Lakes, France controlled all avenues of approach to the great northwest except Hudson Bay. This she had lost through injustice to Radisson, and already the troublesome question had come up. What was to be the boundary between the fur-trading domain of the fresh northward from the St. Lawrence and the fur-trading domain of the English southward from the Hudson Bay? Fewer furs had come down to Quebec from Labrador, the king's domain, from Kamaisqua, Fort William, the stamping ground of Duluth, the forest ranger. The furs of these regions were being drained by the English of Hudson Bay. Talon determined to put a stop to this, and had advised Frontenac accordingly. August 1671, Governor Frontenac dispatched the English Jesuit, Father Albanel, with French guides and Indian voyageurs to set up French arms on Hudson Bay and to bear letters to Radisson and Grazier. The journey was terrific. I have told the story elsewhere. Autumn found the voyagers beyond the forested shores of the Sanguinet and Lake St. John, ascending a current full of boiling cascades towards Lake Miss Astony. Then the frost painted woods became naked as antlers, with wintry winds setting the dead boughs crashing and the ice, thin as mica, forming at the edges of the streams, had presently thickened too hard for the voyagers to break with their paddles. Abanel and his comrades wintered in the Montanais lodges, which were banked so heavily with snow that scarcely a breath of pure air could penetrate the stench. By day the priest wandered from lodge to lodge, preaching the gospel. At night he was to be found afar in the snow-paddled solitudes of the forest engaged in prayer. At last, in the spring of 1672, thaw set the ice loose and the torrents rushing. Downstream on June 10th launched Albanel, running many a wild rushing rapid, taking the leap with the torrential waters over the lesser cataracts, and avoiding the larger falls by long detours over rocks slippery as ice, through swamps to a man's armpits. 
the hinterland of Hudson Bay, with its swamps and rough portages and dank forests of unbroken windfall, was then and is today the hardest canoe trip in North America. But towards the end of June, the French canoes glided out on the arm of the sea called James Bay, hoisted the French flag, and in solemn council with the Indians presented gifts to induce them to come down the Saguenay to Quebec. Fort Rupert, the Hudson's Bay Company's post, consisted of two barrack-like log structures. When Albinal came to the houses, he found not a soul, only boxes of provisions and one lonely dog. A few weeks previously, the men of the English company had gone up the west coast of Hudson Bay, prospecting for the site of a new settlement. Before Abinal had come at all, there was friction among the English. Radisson and Grosier were Catholics and French, and they were supervisors of the entire trade. Bailey, the English governor, was subject to them. So was Captain Gillam with whom they had quarreled long ago, when he refused to take his boat into the Hudson Straits on the voyage from Port Royal. Radisson and Gauzier were establishing more posts up the west coast of the Hudson Bay, farther from the competitions of Duluth's forest rovers on Lake Superior. They had examined the great river Nelson and urged Bailey, the English governor, to build a fort there. Bailey sulked and blustered by turns. In this mood they had come back to Prince Rupert to find the French flag flying above their fort and the English Jesuit, Albinal, snugly enconced with passports from Governor Frontenac and personal letters for Radisson and Grosier. England and France were at peace. Bailey had to respect Albinal's passports but he wished this English envoy of French rivals far enough, and when Captain Gillam came from England, the old quarrel flamed out in open hostility. Radisson and Grosier were accused of being in league with the French traders. A thousand rumors of what next happened have gained currency. One writer says that the English and French came to blows, another that Radisson and Grosier deserted, going back overland with Albinel. In the archives of Hudson Bay House I found a letter stating that the English captain kidnapped the Jesuit Albinel and carried him a captive to England. It may as well be frankly stated these rumors are all sheer fiction. Albinel went back overland as he came. Radisson and Grosier did not go with him, though there may have been blows. Instead, they went to England on Gillam's ship to present their case to the company. The Hudson's Bay Company was uneasy. Radisson and Grosier were aliens. True, Radisson had married Mary Kirk, the daughter of a shareholder, and was bound to the English. But if Radisson and Grosier had forsworn one land, might they not forswear another, and go back to the French, as Frontenac's letters no doubt urged? The company offered Radisson a salary of one hundred pounds a year to stay as clerk in England. They did not want him out on the bay again, but France had offered Radisson a commission in the French Navy. Without more ado, the two Frenchmen left London for Paris, and Paris for America. The year 1676 finds Radisson back in Quebec, engaged in the beaver trade with all those friends of his youth whose names have become famous, La Salle of Fort Frontenac, and Charles Le Moy, the interpreter of Montreal, and Joliet of the Mississippi, and La Forest, who befriended La Salle, Le Chesnay, who opposed him, and Duluth, whose forest rangers roved from Lake Superior to Hudson Bay. It can be guessed what these men talked about over the table of the Sovereign Council at Quebec, whither they had been called to discuss the price of beaver and the use of brandy. The fur traders were, at that time, 
in two distinct rings the ring of la salle and the forest supported by frontenac the montreal ring headed by le chesnay who fought against the opening of the west because lake ontario trade would divert its trade from the ottawa radisson's report of that west coast of hudson bay in area large as all new france interested both factions of the fur trade intensely he was offered two ships for hudson bay by the men of both rings because england and france were at peace frontenac dared not recognize the expedition officially but he winked at it as he winked at many irregularities in the fur trade granted the company of the north license to trade on hudson bay and gave radisson's party passports to fish off gaspe in the venture radisson grosier and the son chouart grosier invested their all possibly amounting to two thousand five hundred dollars each the rest of the money for the expedition came from the godfreys titled seigneurs of three rivers dame sorel widow of an officer in the kerrigan regiment le chesney la salle's lieutenant and others the boats were rickety little tubs unfit for rough northern seas and the crew sulkily underfed men who threatened mutiny at every watering place and only refrained from cutting radisson's throat because he kept them busy july eleventh sixteen eighty two the explorers sheered away from the fishing fleet of the st lawrence and began coasting up the lonely iron shore of labrador ice was met sweeping south in mountainous bergs over isle demons in the straits of belle isle hung storm rack and brown fog as in the days when marguerite roberval pined there then the ships were cutting the tides of labrador here through fog then skimming a coast that was sheer masonry to the very sky again scudding from storm to refuge of some hole in the wall before september the ships rode triumphantly into five fathom hole off nelson river hudson bay here two great rivers wide as the st lawrence rolled to the sea separated by a long tongue of sandy dunes the north river was the nelson the south the hayes approach to both was dangerous shallow sandy and boulder strewn but radisson's vessels were light drop and he ran them in on the tide to hayes river on the south where his men took possession for france and erected long huts as a fort grosier remained at the fort to command the twenty-seven men Young Chouart ranged the swamps and woods for Indians, and Radisson had paddled down the haze from meeting some Assiniboine hunters, when, to his amazement, there rolled across the wooded swamps the most astonishing report that could be heard in desolate solitudes. It was the rolling reverberation, the dull echo of a faraway cannon firing signal after signal like a flash radisson guessed the game after all the hudson's bay company had taken its advice and were sending ships to trade on the west coast the most of men supported by only twenty-seven mutineers would have scuttled ships and escaped overland but the explorers of new france champlain and joliet and la salle were not made of the stuff that runs from trouble picking out three men radisson crossed the marsh northward to reconnoiter on nelson river through the bush he espied a white tent on what is now known as gillam's island a fortress half built and a ship at anchor all night he and his spies watched but none of the builders came near enough to be seized and next day at noon radisson put a bold face on and paddled within cannon shot of the island here was a pretty to-do indeed the frenchman must have laughed till he shook with glee it was not the hudson's bay company ship at all but a poacher a pirate 
an interloper forbidden by the laws of the english company's monopoly and who was the poacher but ben gillam of boston son of captain gillam of the hudson's bay company with whom no doubt he was in collusion to defraud the english traders calling for englishmen to come down to the shore as hostages for fair treatment radisson went boldly aboard the young man's ship saw everything counted the men noted the fact that gillam's crew were mutinous and half frightened the life out of the young boston captain telling him of the magnificent fort the french had on the south river of the frigates and cannon and the powder magazines as a friend he advised young gillam not to permit his men to approach the french otherwise they might be attacked by the quebec soldiers then the crafty radisson paddled off smiling to himself but not so fast not so easy as he drifted down nelson river what should he run into full tilt but the hudson bay company ship itself bristling with cannon manned by his old enemy captain gillam if the two english parties came together radisson was lost he must beat them singly before they met and again putting on a bold face he marched out meeting his former associates and as a friend advised them not to ascend the river further fortunately for radisson both gillam and brigdar the hudson's bay governor were drinking heavily and glad to take his advice the winter passed with radisson perpetuating such tricks on his rivals as a player might with the dummy men on a chessboard but the chessboard with the english rivals for pawns was suddenly upset by the unexpected young gillam discovered that radisson had no fort at all only log cabins with a handful of ragmuffin bush rovers and captain gillam senior got word of young gillam's presence radisson had to act act quickly and on the nail leaving half a dozen men as hostages in young gillam's fort radisson invited the youth to visit the french fort for which the young boston fellow had expressed such skeptical scorn to make a long story short young gillam was no sooner out of his own fort than the french hostages took peaceful possession of it and gillam was no sooner in radisson's fort than the french clapped him a prisoner in their guardroom ignorant that the french had captured young gillam's fort the hudson's bay company men had marched upstream at a dead of night to his rescue the english knocked for admittance the french guards threw open the gates in marched the english traders the french clapped the gates too the english were now themselves prisoners such a double victory would have been impossible to the french if the hudson's bay company men had not fuddled themselves with drink and allowed their fine ship the prince rupert to be wrecked in the ice drive in spring the ice jam wrecked radisson's vessels too so he was compelled to send the most of his prisoners in a sloop down hudson bay to prince rupert where he carried the rest with him on young gillam's ship down to quebec with an enormous cargo of furs by all the laws of navigation ben gillam was nothing more or less than a pirate the monopoly of the hudson's bay company forbade him trading on hudson's bay the license of the company of the north at quebec also excluded him in later years indeed young gillam turned pirate outright and was captured in connection with captain kidd at boston and is supposed to have been executed with the famous pirate but when radisson left nelson in charge of young chart and came down to quebec with young gillam's ship as prize a change had taken place at quebec governor frontenac had been recalled in his place was la barre whose favor could be bought by any man who would pay the bribe and who already ruined la salle by permitting creditors to seize fort frontenac england and france were at peace 
Therefore La Barre gave Gillam's vessel back to him. The revenue collectors were permitted to seize all the furs which La Chesne had not already shipped to France. Though La Barre was reprimanded by the king for both acts, not a sou did Radisson and Grosier and Schwart ever receive for their investment, and Radisson was ordered to report at once to the king in France. End of section 16. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 17 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1679 to 1713 Part Two. The next of Radisson's career has always been the great blot upon his memory, a blot that seemed incomprehensible except on the ground that his English wife had induced him to return to the Hudson's Bay Company, but in the memorials left by Radisson himself in Hudson's Bay House, London, I found the true explanation of his conduct. France and England were, as yet, at peace, but it was a pact of treacherous kind, secret treaty by which the King of England drew pay from the King of France. The King of France dared not offend England by giving public approval to Radisson's capture of the Hudson's Bay Company's territory. Therefore he ordered Radisson to go back to Hudson's Bay Company service and, and restore what he had captured. But the King of France had no notion of relinquishing claim to the vast territory of Hudson's Bay. Therefore he commanded Radisson to go unofficially. Grosier, the brother, seems to have dropped from all engagements from this time, and to have returned to Three Rivers. A copy of the French minister's instructions is to be found in the Radisson records of the Hudson's Bay Company today. Not a sou of compensation was Radisson to receive for the money that he and his friends had invested in the venture of 1682 to 1683. Not a penny of reparation was he to obtain for the furs at Nelson, which he was to turn over to the Hudson's Bay Company. In France, preparation went forward as if for a second voyage to Nelson but Radisson secretly left Paris for London, where he was welcomed by the courtiers of England in May 1684, and given presents by King Charles and the Duke of York, who were shareholders in the Hudson's Bay Company. May 17th he sailed with the Hudson's Bay Company vessels for Port Nelson, and there took over from young Chort the French forts for 20,000 pounds, worth of furs for the English company. Young Short, Grosier, and his five comrades were furious. They had borne the brunt of attack from both English and Indian enemies during Radisson's absence, and they were to receive not a penny for the furs collected, and their fury knew no bounds when they were forcibly carried back to England. The English had invited them on board one of the vessels for last instructions. Quickly the anchor was slipped, sails run out, and the kidnapped Frenchman carried from the bay. In a second, young Short's hand was on the sword, and he would have fought on the spot. But Radisson begged him to conceal his anger, for, urged Radisson, some of these English ruffins would like nothing better than to stab you in a scuffle. In London, Radisson was lionized, publicly thanked by the company, presented to the court, and given a present of a silver plate. As for the young French captives, they were treated royally, voted salaries of a hundred pounds a year, and all their expenses of lodgings paid. 
but when they spoke of returning to France, unexpected obstructions were created. Their money was held back. They were dodged by spies. Finally, they took the oath of allegiance to England and accepted engagements to go back as servants of the Hudson's Bay Company to Nelson at salaries ranging from a hundred pounds to forty pounds, good pay as money was estimated in those days, equal to at least five times as much money of the present day. It was even urged on young Short that he should take an English wife, as Radisson had, but the young Frenchmen smiled quietly to themselves. Secret offers of a title had been conveyed to Schwart from the French ambassador and his mother in Three Rivers, he wrote. I could not go to Paris. I was not at liberty. But I shall be at the rendezvous or Paris trying. I cannot say more in a letter. I would have left this kingdom, but they hold back my pay, and orders have been given to arrest me if I try to leave. Assure Mr. Duluth of my humble services. I shall see him as soon as I can. Pray tell my good friend, Jean Perry. Perry, it will be remembered, was a bush ranger of Duluth's band, who had been with Joliet on Lake Superior. As for Radisson, the English kept faith with him as long as the Stuarts and his personal friends ruled the English court. He spent the summers on Hudson Bay as superintendent of trade, the winters in England supervising cargoes and sales. His home was on Seething Lane, near the Great Tower, where one of his friends was commander. Near him dwelt the merchant princes of London, like the Kirks and the Robinsons and the Youngs. His next-door neighbor was the man of fashion, Samuel Pepys, in whose hand Radisson's journals of his voyages finally fell. His income at this time was a hundred pounds in dividends, a hundred pounds in salary, equal to about five times that amount in modern money. Then came a change in Radisson's fortunes. The Stuarts were dethroned, and their friends dispersed. The shareholders of the fur company bore names of men who knew not of Radisson's services. War destroyed the fur company's dividends. Radisson's income fell off to fifty pounds a year. His family had increased, so had his debts, and he had long since been compelled to move from fashionable quarters. A petition filed in a lawsuit avers that he was in great mental anxiety lest his children should come to want, but he won his lawsuits against the company for arrears of salary. Peace brought about a resumption of dividends, and the old pathfinder seems to have passed his last years in comparative comfort. Some time between March and July, 1710, Radisson sent out on the last long voyage of all men, dying near London. His burial place is unknown. As far as Canada is concerned, Radisson stands foremost as pathfinder of the great Northwest. But to return to good friend Jean Paré, whom the Frenchmen forced into English service were to meet somewhere on Hudson Bay, it is like a story from Borderland Forays. Seven large ships set sail from England for Hudson Bay in 1685, carrying Radisson and young Short and the five unwilling Frenchmen. The company's forts on the bay now numbered four. Nelson, highest up on the west, Albany, southward on an island at the mouth of Albany River, Moose, just where James Bay turns westward, and Rupert at the southeast corner. But French ships under Le Martinaire of the Sovereign Council had also set sail from Quebec in 1685, commissioned by the indignant fur traders to take Radisson dead or alive, for Quebec did not know the secret orders of the French court, which had occasioned Radisson's last defection. 
july saw the seven hudson's bay ships worming their way laboriously through the ice floes of the straits small sails only were used with grappling hooks thrown out on the ice pans and crews toiling to their armpits in ice sludge the boats pulled themselves forward resting on the lee side of some ice flow during ebb tide all hands out to fight the roaring ice pans when the tide began to come in at length on the night of july twenty seventh with crews exhausted and the timbers badly rammed the ship steered to rest in a harbor off diggs island sheltered from the ice drive the nights of that northern sea are light almost as day but clouds had shrouded the sky and white mist was rising from the water when there glided like ghosts from gloom two strange vessels before the exhausted crews of the english ships were well awake the waters were churned to foam by a roar of cannonading the strange ships had bumped keels with the little merchant prepatuna of the hudson's bay radisson on whose head lay a price was first to realize that they were attacked by the French raiders, and his ship was out with sails and off like a bird, followed by the other English vessels, all except the little Pepertuna, now in death grapple between her foes. Captain Hume, Mate Smithson, and Grimmington fought like demons to keep the French from boarding her, but they were knocked down, fettered, and clapped below hatches, whilst the vicars plundered the cargo. Fourteen men were put to the sword. August witnessed ship, cargo, and captives brought into Quebec amid noisy acclaim and roar of cannon. The French had not captured Radisson nor ransomed Schwart, but there was booty to the raiders. New France had proved her right to trade on Hudson Bay, spite of peace between France and England, or secret commands to Radisson. Thrown in a dungeon below Chateau St. Louis, Quebec, the English captives heard wild rumors of another raid on the bay, overland in winter, and Smithsend, by secret messenger, sends warning to England and for his pains is sold with his fellow captives into slavery in martinique whence he escapes to england before the summer of sixteen eighty six but what is john Pere of duluth bushrovers doing all unconscious of the raid on the ships the governors of the four english forts awaited the coming of the annual supplies at albany was sort of a harbor beacon as well as a lookout built high on scaffolding above a hill one morning in august of sixteen eighty five the sentry on the lookout was amazed to see three men white men in a canoe staring swiftly down the rain-swollen river from the up-country such a thing was impossible white men from the interior whence did they come governor sergeant came striding to the fort gate ordering his cannon manned behold nothing more dangerous than three french forest rangers dressed in buckskins but with manners a trifle too smooth for such rough garb one doffs his cap to governor sergeant and introduces himself as jean pere a woodsman out hunting england and france were at peace so governor sergeant invited the three mysterious gentlemen inside for a breakfast of sparkling wines and good game hoping no doubt that the wines would unlock the gay fellow's tongues to tell what game they were playing as the wine passed freely there were stories of the hunt and the voyage and the annual ships when might the ships be coming humph matters sergeant through his beard and he doesn't urge these knights of the wild woods to tarry longer. Their canoe glides gaily down coast to the salt marshes, where the shooting is good, but by chance that night, purely by chance, the French leave their canoe so that the tide will carry it away. Then they come back, crestfallen, to the English fort, 
Meanwhile, a ship has arrived with the story of the raid on the Perpetunia. Sargent is so enraged that he sends two of the French spies across to Charlton Island, where they can hunt or die. Monsieur Jean Paré he casts into the cellar of Albany, with irons on his wrists and balls on his feet. When the ships sail for England, Paré is sent back as prisoner without having had one word with short Grazier. As for the two Frenchmen placed on Charlton Island, did Sargent think they were bush rovers and would stay on an island? By October they have laid up store of moose meat, built themselves a canoe, paddled across to the mainland, and are speeding like wildfire overland to Michimackinac with word that Jean Paré is held prisoner at Albany. As Jean Paré drops out of history here, it may be said that he was kept prisoner in England as guarantee for the safety of the English crew held prisoners at Quebec. When he escaped to France, he was given money and a minor title for his services. The news that Paré lay in a dungeon on Hudson Bay supplied the very excuse that the Quebec fur traders needed for an overland raid in time of peace. These were the wild rumors of which the captive English crew sent warning to England, but the northern straits would not be open to the company ships before June of 1686, and already a hundred wild French bushrovers were rallying to ascend the Ottawa to raid the English on Hudson Bay. And now a change comes in Canadian annals. For half a century its story is a record of lawless raids. Bloody foray, daredevil courage, combined with the most fiendish cruelty and sublime heroism. Only a few of these raids can be narrated here. June 18, 1686, when the long twilight of the northern night merged with dawn, there came out from the thicket of underbrush round Moose Factory, Hudson Bay, one hundred bushrovers led by Chevalier de Troyes of Niagara, accompanied by Le Chesnay of the fur trade, Quebec, and the Jesuit, Sylvie. Of the raiders, sixty-six were Indians under Pierre Le Moy de Albertville and his brothers Maricot and St. Helene aged about twenty-four, sons of Charles Le Moy, the Montreal interpreter. Moose Factory at this time boasted fourteen cannon, log-slab palisades, commodious warehouses, and four stone bastions, one with three hundred pounds of powder, and another used as barracks for twelve soldiers, another housing beaver pelts, and a fourth serving as kitchen. Iberville and his brothers, scouting round on different sides of the fort, soon learned that not a sentinel was on duty. The great gate opposite the river, studded with brass nails, was securely bolted, but not a cannon had been loaded. The bush rangers then cast aside all clothing that would hamper, and pistol in hand advanced silent and stealthily as wildcats. Not a twig crunched beneath the moccasin tread. The water lay like glass, and the fourth slept, silent as death. Hastily each raider had knelt for the blessing of the priest. Pistols had been recharged. Iberville bade his wild Indians not to forget that the sovereign council of Quebec offered ten crowns reward for every enemy slain, twenty for every enemy captured. In fact, there could be no turning back. Two thousand miles of juniper swamps and forests lay between the bush rovers and home. They must conquer or perish. Detroit led his white soldiers round to make a pretense of attack from the waterfront. Iberville posted his sixty-six Indians along the walls with muskets rammed through the loopholes. Then, with an unearthly yell, the Lemoy brothers were over the tops of the pickets, swords in hand, before the English soldiers had awakened. 
the English gunner reeled from his cannon at the main gate with head split to the collarbone. The gates were thrown wide, trees ran the doors open, and Iberville had dashed halfway up the stairs of the main house before the inmates, rushing out in their nightshirts, realized what had happened. Two men only were killed, one on each side. The French were masters of Moose Fort in less than five minutes, with sixteen captives and rich supply of ammunition. Eastward of Moose was Rupert Fort, where the company's ship anchored. Hither the raiders plied their canoes by sea. Look at the map. Across the bottom of James Bay projects a long tongue of swampland. To save time, Iberville portaged across this, and by July 1st was opposite Prince Rupert's bastions. At the dock lay the English ship. That day Iberville's men kept in hiding, but at night he had ambushed his men along the shore and paddled across to the ship. Just as Iberville stepped on the deck, a man on guard sprang at his throat. One blow of Iberville's sword killed the Englishman on the spot. Stamping to call the crew aloft, Iberville sabred the men as they scrambled up the hatches till the governor himself threw up hands in unconditional surrender. The din had alarmed the fort, and hot shot snapping fire from the loopholes kept the raiders off, till the Lemoy brothers succeeded in scrambling to the roofs of the bastions, hacking holes through the rough thatch and firing inside. This drove the English gunners from their cannon. A moment later the raiders were on the walls. It was a repetition of the fight at Moose Factory. The English, taken by surprise, surrendered at once, and the French now had thirty prisoners, a good ship, two forts, but no provisions. Northwestward, three hundred miles, lay Albany Fort. Iberville led off in canoes with the bush rovers. Detroit's followed on the English boat with French soldiers and English prisoners. To save time, as the bay seemed shallow, Iberville struck out from the shore across seas. All at once a north wind began whipping the waters, sweeping down a maelstrom of churning ice. Worse still, fog fell thick as wool. Anyone who knows canoe travel knows the danger. Iberville avoided swamping by ordering his men to camp for the night on the shifting ice pans canoes held above heads where the ice crush was the wildest the voyageurs clinging hand to hand making a lifeline if one chanced to slither through the ice slush when daylight came with worse fog iberville kept his pistol firing to guide his followers and so pushed on four days the dangerous traverse lasted but august first the bush rovers were in camp below the cliffs of albany Indians had forewarned Governor Sargent. The loopholes of his palisades bristled with muskets and heavy guns that set the bullets flying as soon as Detroit arrived and tried to land the cannon captured from the other forts for assault on Albany. Drums beating, flags flying, soldiers in line, a French messenger goes halfway forward and demands of an English messenger come halfway out the surrender of Sieur Jean Paré, languishing in the dungeons of Albany. The English governor sends curt word back that Paré has been sent home to France long ago, and demands what in thunder the French mean by these raids in time of peace. The French retire that night to consider. Cannon they have, but they have used up nearly all their ammunition. They have thirty prisoners, but they have no provisions. The prisoners have told them there are fifty thousand pounds worth of furs stored at Albany. Inside the fort the English were in almost as bad way. The larder was lean, powder was scarce, and the men were wildly mutinous, threatening to desert en masse for the French on the excuse 
they had not hired to fight and if any of us lost a leg the company could not make it good at the end of two days desultory firing the company governor captured down at rupert came to sergeant and told him frankly that the bloodthirsty bushrovers were desperate they had either to conquer or starve and if they were compelled to fight there would be no quarter men and women alike would be butchered in hand-to-hand -hand fight still sergeant hung on hoping for the annual frigate of the company then powder failed utterly still sergeant would not show the white flag so an underfactor flourished a white sheet from an upper window chevalier de troyes came forward and seated himself on one of the cannon governor sergeant went out and seated himself on the same cannon with two bottles of wine the english of albany were allowed to withdraw to charlton island to await the company ship as for the other prisoners those who were not compelled to carry the plundered furs back to quebec were turned adrift in the woods to find their way overland north to nelson iberville's bushrovers were back in montreal by october end of section seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number eighteen of canada the empire of the north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1686 to 1698, Part 1 For ten years, Hudson Bay becomes the theater of the northern buccaneers and bush raiders. A treaty of neutrality in 1686 provides that the bay shall be held in common by the fur traders of England and France. But the adventures of England and the bush rovers of Quebec have no notion of leaving things so uncertain. Spite of truce, both fit out raiders and the king of France, according to the shifting diplomacy of the day, issues secret orders to permit not a vestige of english possession on the northern bay maricourt le moy held the newly captured forts on the south shore of james bay till iberville came back overland in sixteen eighty seven the fort at rupert had been completely abandoned after the french victory of the previous summer and the hudson's bay company sloop the young had just sailed into the port to re-establish the fur post. Iberville surrounded the sloop by his bush rovers, captured it with all hands, and dispatched four spies across to Charlton Island, where another sloop, the Churchill, swung at anchor. Here Iberville's run of luck turned. Three of his four spies were captured, fettered, and thrown into the hold of the vessel for the winter. In the spring of 1688, one was brought above decks to help the English sailors. Watching his chance, the grizzled bush rover waited till six of the English crew were up the ratlines. Quick as flash, the Frenchman tiptoed across the decks in his noiseless moccasins, took one precautionary glance over his shoulder, brained two Englishmen with an axe, liberated his comrades, and at pistol point, kept the other Englishmen up the mass till he and his fellows had righted the ship and steered the vessel across to Rupert River, where the provisions were just in time to save Iberville's party from starvation. This episode is typical of what went on at the Hudson's Bay forts for ten years. Each year when the English ships came out to Nelson on the west coast, armed bands were sent south to wrest the forts on james bay from the french and each spring when iberville's bush rovers came gliding down the rivers 
in their canoes from Canada, there was a fight to drive out the English. Then the Indians would scatter to their hunting grounds. No more loot of furs for a year. The English would sail away in their ships, the French glide away in their canoes, and for a winter the uneasy quiet of calm between two thunderclaps would rest over the waters of Hudson Bay. In the spring of 1688, about the time that the brave bushrovers had brought the English ship from the Charlton Island across to Rupert River, two English frigates under Captain Moon with twenty-four soldiers over and above the crews had come south from Nelson to attack the French fur traders at Albany. As ill luck would have it, the ice floes began driving inshore. The English ships found themselves locked in the ice before the besieged fort. Across the jam from Rupert River dashed Iberville with his Indian bandits, portaging where the ice floes covered the water, paddling where lanes of clear way parted the floating drift. Iberville hid his men in the tarmac swamps till eighty-two Englishmen had landed, and all unsuspecting left their ships unguarded. Iberville only waited till the furs in the fort had been transferred to the holds of the vessels. The ice cleared. The Frenchman rushed his bush rovers on board, seized the vessel with the most valuable cargo, and sailed gaily out of Albany for Quebec. The astounded English set fire to the other ship and retreated overland. But the daredevil bush rovers were not yet clear of trouble. As the ice drive jammed and held them in Hudson Straits, they were aghast to see, sailing full tilt with the roaring tide of the straits, a fleet of English frigates, the Hudson Bay Company's annual ships. But Iberville sniffed at danger as a war horse glories in gunpowder. He laughed his merriness, and as the ice drive locked all ships within gunshot, ran up an English flag above his French crew, and actually signaled the captains of the English frigates to come aboard and visit him while the ice cleared. Hoisting sail, he showed swift heels to the foe. Iberville's ambition was now to sweep all the English from Hudson Bay, in other words, to capture Nelson on the west coast whence came the finest furs, but the other raids called him to Canada. It will be recalled that La Salle's enemies had secretly encouraged the Iroquois to attack the tribes of the Illinois, and now the fur traders of New York were encouraging the Iroquois to pillage the Indians of the Mississippi Valley, in order to divert peltries from the French on the St. Lawrence to the English at New York. Savages of the North, rallied by Perrault and Duluth and La Motte Cadillac, came down by the lakes to Fort Frontenac to aid the French, but they found that La Barre, the new governor, foolish old man, had been frightened into making peace with the Iroquois warriors, abandoning the Illinois to Iroquois raid, and utterly forgetful that a peace which is not a victory is not worth the paper it is written on. For the shame of this disgraceful peace, La Barre was recalled to France, and the Marquis de Denonville, a brave soldier, sent out as governor. Unfortunately, Denonville did not understand conditions in the colony. The Jesuit missionaries were commissioned to summon the Iroquois to a conference at Fort Frontenac, but when the deputies arrived, they were seized, tortured, and fifty of them shipped to France by the king's order to serve as slaves on the royal galleys. It was an act of treachery heinous beyond measure, and exposed the Jesuit missionaries among the five nations to terrible vengeance. But the Iroquois code of honor was higher than the white man's. Go home, they warned the Jesuit missionary. We have now every right to treat thee as our foe, but we shall not do so. Thy heart 
has had no share in the wrong done to us. We shall not punish thee for the crimes of another, though, though didst act as the unconscious tool. But leave us. When our young men chant the song of war, they may take counsel only of their fury and harm thee. Go to thine own people. And furnishing him with guides, they sent him to Quebec. Though Denonville marched with his soldiers through the Iroquois cantons, he did little harm and less good, for the wily warriors had simply withdrawn their families into the woods, and the Iroquois were only bidding their time for fearful vengeance. This lust of vengeance was now terribly wedded. Dongan, the English governor of New York, had been ordered by King James of England to observe the treaty of neutrality between England and France, but this did not hinder him supplying the Iroquois with arms to raid the French and secretly advising them not to bury the war hatchet, just to hide it in the grass and stand on their guard to begin the war anew. Nor did the treaty of neutrality prevent the French from raiding Hudson Bay and ordering shot in cold blood any French bushrover who dared to guide the English traders to the country of the Upper Lakes. In addition to English influence, egging on the Iroquois, the treachery of the Huron chief, the Rat, lashed the vengeance of the Five Nations to a fury. He had come down to Fort Frontenac to aid the French. He was told that the French had again arranged peace with the Iroquois, and deputies were even now on their way from the Five Nations. Peace, the old Huron chief was dumbfounded. What were these fool French doing, trusting to an Iroquois peace? Ah, he grunted, that may be well, and he withdrew without revealing a sign of his intentions. Then he lay in ambush on the trail of the deputies, fell on the Iroquois peace messengers with fury, slaughtered half the band, then sent the others back with word that he had done this by order of Denonville, the French governor. There, grunted the rat grimly, I've killed the peace for them. We'll see how Onontio gets out of this mess. Meanwhile, war had been declared between England and France. The Stuarts had been dethroned. France was supporting the exiled monarch, and William of Orange had become king of England. Iberville and Duluth and La Motte Cadillac, the famous fighters of Canada's Wildwood, were laying plans before the French governor for the invasion and conquest of New York, and New York was preparing to defend itself by pouring ammunition and firearms free of cost into the hands of the Iroquois. Then the Iroquois vengeance fell. Between the night and morning of August 4th and 5th in 1689, a terrific thunderstorm had broken over Montreal. Amidst the crack of hail and crash of falling trees, with the thunder reverberating from the mountain like cannonading, Whilst the frightened people stood gazing at the play of lightning across their windows, 1,400 Iroquois warriors landed behind Montreal, beached their canoes, and stole upon the settlement. What next followed beggar's description, nothing else like it occurs in the history of Canada. For years this summer was to be known as the Year of the Massacre. Before the storm subsided, the Iroquois had stationed themselves in circles round every house outside the walls of Montreal. At the signal of a whistle, the warriors fell on the settlement like beasts of prey. Neither doors nor windows were fastened in that age, and the people, deep in sleep after the vigil of the storm, were dragged from their beds before they were well awake. Men, women, and children fell victims to such ingenuity of cruelty as only savage vengeance could conceive. Children were dashed to pieces before their parents' eyes. Aged parents 
tomahawked before struggling sons and daughters, fathers held powerless that they might witness the tortures wreaked on wives and daughters. Homes which had heard some alarm and were on guard were set on fire, and those who perished in the flames died a merciful death compared to those who fell in the hands of the victors. By daybreak two hundred people had been wantonly butchered. A hundred and fifty more had been taken captives. As if their vengeance could not be glutted, the Iroquois crossed the river opposite Montreal and, in full sight of the fort, weakly garrisoned and paralyzed with fright, spent the rest of the week, day and night, torturing the white captives. By night victims could be seen tied to the torture stake amid the wreathing flames, with the tormentors dancing round the camp fire in maniacal ferocity. Denonville was simply powerless. He lost his head and seemed so panic-stricken that he forbade even volunteer bands from rallying to the rescue. For two months the Iroquois overran Canada unchecked. Indeed, it was years before the boldness engendered by this foray became reduced to respect for French authority. Settlement after settlement the marauders raided. From Montreal to Three River, crops went up in flame and the terrified habitants came cowering with their families to the shelter of the palisades. In the midst of this universal terror came the country's savior. Frontenac had been recalled because he quarreled with the intendant, and he quarreled with the Jesuits, and he quarreled with the fur traders, but his bitterest enemies did not deny that he could put the fear of the Lord and respect for the French into the Iroquois' heart. Arbitrarily he was as a czar, but just always. To be sure he mended his fortunes by personal fur trade, but in doing so he cheated no man, and he worked no injustice, and he wrought in all things for the lasting good of the country. Homage he demanded as to a king once going so far as to drive the sovereign counselors from his presence with the flat of a sword, but he firmly believed, and he had publicly proved, that he was worthy of homage, and that the men who are forever shouting liberty, liberty and the people's rights, are frequently wolves in sheep's clothing, eating out of the vials of a nation's prosperity. Here, then, was the haughty, hot-headed, aggressive Frontenac, sent back in his old age to restore the prestige of New France, where both La Barre, the grafter, and Denonville, the courteous Christian gentleman, had failed. To this period of Iroquois raids belongs one of the most heroic episodes in Canadian life. The only settlers who had not fled to the protection of the palisaded forts were the grand old seigneurs, the new nobility of New France, whose mansions were like forts in themselves, palisaded with stone bastions and water supply and yards for stock and mills inside the walls. Here the seigneurs, wildwood knights of a wilderness age, held little courts that were imitations of the governor's pomp at Quebec. Sometimes during war the seigneur's wife and daughters were reduced to plowing in the fields and laboring with the women servants at the harvest, but ordinarily the life at a seigneury was life of petty grandeur. With such style as the backwoods afforded, in the hall or great room of the manor house was usually an enormous table used both as court of justice by the seigneur and festive board. On one side was a huge fireplace with its homemade benches, on the other a clumsy card chiffonier loaded with solid silver. In the early days the seigneur's bedstand might be in the same room, an enormous affair with penelopes of curtains and counterpanes of fur rugs and 
feather mattresses so high that it almost necessitated a ladder but in the matter of dress the rude life made up in style what it lacked in the equipments of a grand mansion the bishop's description of the women's dresses i have already given though at this period the women had added to the sins a bows and fur bellows and frills which the bishop deplored the yet more heinous error of such enormous hoops that it required fine manoeuvring on the part of a grand dame to negotiate the door of the family coach and however pompous the seigneur's air it must have suffered temporary eclipse in that coach from the hoops of his spouse and his spouse's daughters as for the seigneur when he was not dressed in buckskin leading bushrovers on raids he appeared magnificent in all the grandeur that a twenty pounds wig and spanish laces and french ruffles and imported satins could lend his portly person and if the figure were not portly one may venture to guess from the pictures of stout gentlemen in the quilted brocades of the period that padding made up what nature lacked end of section eighteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section nineteen of canada the empire of the north this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1686 to 1698, Part 2. Such a seigneury was Verche some twenty miles from montreal on the south side of the st lawrence monsieur de versay was an officer in one of the regiments and chanced to be absent from home during october of sixteen ninety six doing duty at quebec madame de versay was visiting in montreal strange as it may seem the fort and the family had been left in charge of the daughter madeline at this time only fourteen years of age at eight o'clock in the morning of october twenty second she had gone four hundred paces outside the fort gates when she heard the report of musket firing the rest of the story may be told in her own words i at once saw that the iroquois were firing at our settlers who lived near the fort one of our servants called out fly mademoiselle fly the iroquois are upon us instantly i saw some forty-five iroquois running towards me already within pistol shot determined to die rather than fall in their hands i ran for the fort praying to the blessed virgin holy mother save me let me perish rather than fall in their hands meanwhile my pursuers paused to fire their guns bullets whistled past my ears once within hearing of the fort i shouted to arms to arms there were but two soldiers in the fort and they were so overcome by fear that they ran to hide in the bastion at the gates i found two women wailing for the loss of their husbands then i saw several stakes had fallen from the palisades where enemies could gain entrance so i seized the fallen planks and urged the women to give a hand putting them back in their places then i ran to the bastion where i found two of the soldiers lighting a fuse what are you going to do i demanded blow up the fort answered one cowardly wretch be gone you rascals i commanded putting on a soldier's helmet and seizing a musket then to my little brothers let us fight to the death remember what father has always said that gentlemen are born to shed their blood in the service of god and their king my brothers and the two soldiers kept up a steady fire from the loopholes i ordered the cannon fired 
to call in our soldiers who were hunting but the grief-stricken women inside kept wailing so loud that i had to warn them their shrieks would betray our weakness to the enemy while i was speaking i caught sight of a canoe on the river it was seigneur pierre fontaine with his family coming to visit us i asked the soldiers to go out and protect their landing but they refused then ordering laviette our servant to stand sentry at the gate i went out myself wearing a soldier's helmet and carrying a musket i left orders if, if i were killed the gates were to be kept shut and the fort defended i hoped the iroquois would think this a ruse on my part to draw them within gunshot of our walls that was just what happened and i got pierre fontaine and his family safely inside by putting a bold face on our whole garrison consisted of my two little brothers aged twelve one servant two soldiers one abitant aged eighty and a few women servants strengthened by the fontaines we began firing when the sun went down the night set in with a fearful storm of northeast wind and snow i expected the iroquois under cover of the storm gathering our people together i said god has saved us during the day now we must be careful for the night to show you i am not afraid to take my part i undertake to defend the fort with the old man and a soldier who has never fired a gun you pierre fontaine and la bonte and galette the two soldiers go to the bastion with the women and children if i am taken never surrender though i am burnt and cut to pieces before your eyes you have nothing to fear if you will make some show of fight i posted two of my young brothers on one of the bastions the man of eighty on the third and myself took the fourth despite the whistling of the wind we kept the cry all is well all is well echoing and re-echoing from corner to corner one would have imagined the fort was crowded with soldiers and the iroquois afterwards confessed they had been completely deceived that the vigilance of the guard kept them from attempting to scale the walls about midnight the sentinel at the gate bastion called out mademoiselle i hear something i saw it was our cattle let me open the gates urged to the sentry god forbid said i the savages are likely behind driving the animals in nevertheless i did open the gates and let the cattle in my brothers standing on each side ready to shoot if an indian appeared at last came daylight and we were hopeful for aid from montreal but marguerite fontaine being timorous as all parisian women are begged her husband to try and escape the poor husband was almost distracted as she insisted and he told her he would set her out in the canoe with her two sons who can paddle it but he would not abandon mademoiselle de verche i had been twenty-four hours without rest or food and had not once gone from the bastion on the eighth day of the siege lieutenant de la montmerie reached the fort during the night with forty men one of our sentries had called out who goes i was dozing with my head on a table and musket across my arm the sentry said there were voices in the water i called who are you they answered french come to your aid i went down to the bank saying sir but you are welcome i surrender my arms to you mademoiselle he answered they are in good hands i forgot one incident on the day of the attack i remembered about one in the afternoon that our linen was outside the fort but the soldiers refused to go out for it armed with our guns my brothers made two trips outside the walls for our linen the iroquois must have thought it a trick to lure them closer for they did not approach it need scarcely be added that the brave mothers made brave sons and is not surprising that twenty-five years later when madeleine verche had become the wife of monsieur de la notiere 
her own life was saved from Abenaki Indians by her little son, age twelve. But to return to Count Frontenac, marching up the steep streets of Quebec to Chateau St. Louis that October evening of 1689, amid the jubilant shouts of friends and enemies, Jesuit and Recollect, fur trader and counselor, the haughty governor set himself to the task of not only crushing the Iroquois, but invading and conquering the land of the English, whom he believed had furnished the arms to the Iroquois. Now that war had been openly declared between England and France. Frontenac was determined on a campaign of aggression. He would keep the English so busy defending their own borders they would have no time to tamper with the Indian alleys of the French on the Mississippi. This is one of the darkest pages of Canada's past. War is not a pretty thing at any time, but war that lets loose the bloodhounds of Indian ferocity leaves the blackest scar of all. There were to be three war parties, one from Quebec to attack the English settlements around what is now portland maine a second from three rivers to lay waste the borderlands of new hampshire a third from montreal to assault the english and dutch of the upper hudson the montrealers set out midwinter of sixteen ninety a few months after frontenac's arrival led by the lemoy brothers st helene and maricourt and iberville with one of the Le Beers and de Alambouste, nephew of the first de Alambouste at Montreal. The raiders consisted of some 250 men, 100 Indian converts, and 150 bushrovers, hardy, supple, inured to the wilderness as to native air, whites and Indians dressed alike in blanket coat, hoods hanging down the back, buckskin trousers, beaded moccasins, snowshoes of short length for forest travel, cased musket on shoulder, knife, hatchet, pistols, bullet pouch hanging from the sashed belt, and provisions in a blanket, knapsack fashion, carried on the shoulders. The woods lay snow-padded, silent, somber. Up the river of Richelieu, over the rolling drifts, glided the bushrovers somewhere on the headwaters of the hudson the indians demanded what place they were to attack iberville answered albany humph grunted the indians with dry smile at the camp fire since when have the french become so brave a midwinter thaw now turned the snowy levels to swimming lagoons where snowshoes were useless and men had to wade knee-deep day after day through swamps of ice water then came one of those sudden changes hard frost with a blinding snowstorm where the trail forked for albany and schenectady it was decided to follow the latter and about four o'clock in the afternoon on the eighth of february the bush rovers reached a hut where there chanced to be several mohawk squaws Crowding round the chimney place to dry their clothes, now stiff with ice, the bushrangers learned from the Indian women Schenectady lay completely unguarded. There had been some village festival that day among the Dutch settlers. The gates at both ends of the town lay wide open, as if in derison of danger from the far distant French. A snowman had been mockingly rolled up to the western gate a sentry with a sham pipe stuck in his mouth. The Indian rangers harangued their braves, urging them to wash out all wrongs in the blood of the enemy, and the Lemoy brothers moved from man to man, giving orders for utter silence. At eleven that night, shrouded by snowfall, the bush rovers reached the palisades of Schenectady. They intended to defer the assault till dawn but the cold hastened action and uncasing their muskets they filed silently past the snowman in the middle of the open gate and encircled the little village of fifty houses when the lines met at the far gate completely investing the town a wild yell rent the air doors were hacked down 
Indians with tomahawks stood guard outside the windows, and the dastardly work began, as gratuitous as butchery of innocent people as ever the Iroquois perpetrated in their worst raids. Two hours the massacre lasted, and when it was over, the French had, to their everlasting discredit, murdered in cold blood thirty-eight men, among them the poor inoffensive Domini, ten women, twelve children, and the victors held ninety captives. To the credit of Everbill, he offered life to one Glen and his family, who had aided in ransoming many French from the Iroquois, and he permitted this man to name so many friends that the bloodthirsty Indians wanted to know if all Schenectady were related to this white man. One other house in town was spared, that of a widow with five children, under whose roof a wounded Frenchman lay. For the rest, Schenectady was reduced to ashes, the victors harnessing the Dutch farmers' horses to carry off the plunder. Of all the captives, twenty-seven men and boys were carried back to Quebec. The other captives, mainly women and children, were given to the Indians. Forty livres for every human scalp were paid by the sovereign council of Quebec to the raiders. The record of the raiders led from Three Rivers by Francis Hertel was almost the same. Setting out in January, he was followed by twenty-five French and twenty-five Indians to the border lands between Maine and New Hampshire. The end of March saw the bushrovers outside the little village of Salmon Falls. Thirty inhabitants were tomahawked on the spot, the houses burned, and one hundred prisoners carried off. But the news had gone like wildfire to neighboring settlements, and Hertel was pursued by two hundred Englishmen. He placed his bushrovers on a small bridge across Wooster River, and here held the pursuers at bay till darkness enabled him to escape. But the darkest deed of infamy was perpetrated by the third band of raiders, a deed that reveals the glories of war as they exist, stripped of pageantry. Port Neuf had led the raiders from Quebec, and he was joined by the famous leader of the Abnaki Indians, Baron de Saint Castin, from the border lands between Acadia and Maine. Later, when Hertel struck through the woods, with some of his followers, Portneuf's men numbered five hundred. With these he attacked Fort Loyal, or what now is Portland, Maine, in the month of June. The fort boasted eight great guns and one hundred soldiers. Under cover of the guns, Lieutenant Clark and thirty men sallied out to reconnoiter the attacking forces ambushed in woods round a pasturage. At a musket crack, the English were literally cut to pieces, four men only escaping back to the fort. The French then demanded unconditional surrender. The English asked six days to consider. In six days, English vessels would have come to the rescue. Secure under a bluff of the ocean cliff from the cannon fire of the fort, the French began to trench an approach to the palisades. Combustibles had been placed against the walls, when the English again asked a parley, offering to surrender if the French would swear by the living God to conduct them in safety to the nearest English post. To these conditions the French agreed. Whether they could not control their Indian alleys, or had not intended to keep the terms, matters little. The English had no sooner marched from the fort than, with a wild whoop, the Indians fell on men, women, and children. Some were killed by a single blow, others reserved for the torture stake. Only four Englishmen survived the onslaught to be carried prisoners to Quebec. The French had been victorious on all three raids, but they were victories over which posterity will never boast, which no writer dare describe in all the detail of their horrors, and which leave a black blot on the estuan of Canada. End of section 19. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.